It is easy to see that a greater self-reliance must work a revolution in all the offices and relations of men, in their religion, in their education, in their pursuits, their modes of living, their association, in their property, in their speculative views. One, in what prayers do men allow themselves? That which they call a holy office is not so much brave and manly. Prayer looks abroad and asks for some foreign addition to come through some foreign virtue and loses itself in endless mazes of natural and supernatural and mediatorial and miraculous. Prayer that craves a particular commodity, anything less than all good, is vicious. Prayer is the contemplation of the facts of life from the highest point of view. It is the soliloquy of a beholding and jubilant soul. It is the Spirit of God pronouncing His works good. But prayer as a means to affect the private end is meanness and theft. It supposes dualism and not unity in nature and consciousness. As soon as the man is one with God, he will not beg. He will then see a prayer in all action. The prayer of the farmer kneeling in his field to weed it. The prayer of the rower kneeling with the stroke of his oar. Our true prayers heard throughout nature, though for cheap ends. Karatak and Fletcher's Banduka, when admonished to inquire the mind of the god Adate, replies, His hidden meaning lies in our endeavors. Our valors are our best gods. Another sort of false prayers are our regrets. Discontent is the want of self-reliance. It is infirmity of will. Regret calamities if you can thereby help the sufferer. If not, attend your own work, and already the evil begins to be repaired. Our sympathy is just as base. We come to them who weep foolishly and sit down and cry for company, instead of imparting to them the truth and health in rough electric shocks, putting them once more in communication with their own reason. The secret fortune of joy is in our hands. Welcome evermore to gods and men is the self-helping man. For him all doors are flung wide. Him all tongues greet, all honors crown. All eyes follow with desire. Our love goes out to him and embraces him because he did not need it. We solicitously and apologetically caress and celebrate him because he held on his way and scorned our disapprobation. The gods love him because men hated him. To the persevering mortal, says Zoroaster, the blessed immortals are swift. As men's prayers are a disease of the will, so are their creeds a disease of the intellect. They say with those foolish Israelites, let not God speak to us lest we die. Speak thou, speak any man with us, and we will obey. Everywhere I am hindered of meeting God and my brother because he has shut his own temple doors and recites fables merely of his brothers or his brother's brother's God. Every new mind is a new classification if it prove a mine of uncommon activity and power, a Locke, a Lavoisier, a Hutton, a Bentham, a Fourier, it imposes this classification on other men. And lo, a new system. In proportion to the depth of the thought, and so to the number of the objects it touches and brings within reach of the pupil, is its complacency. But chiefly this is apparent in creeds and churches, which are also classifications of some powerful mind acting on the elemental thought of duty and man's relation to the highest, such as Calvinism, 
Quakerism, Swedenborgism. The pupil takes the same delight in subordinating everything to the new terminology. As a girl who has just learned botany and seen a new earth and new seasons thereby, it will happen for a time that the pupil will find his intellectual power has grown by the study of his master's mind. But in all unbalanced minds, the classification is idolized, passes for the end, and not for a speedily exhaustible means so that the walls of the system blend to their eye in the remote horizon with the walls of the universe. The luminaries of heaven seem to them hung on the arch their master built. They cannot imagine how you aliens have any right to see. How you can see. It must be somewhat that you stole the light from us. Do they not yet perceive that light, unsystematic, indomitable, will break into any cabin, even into theirs? Let them chirp a while and call it their own. If they are honest and do well, presently their neat new pinfold will be too straight and low, will crack will lean, will rot, and vanish. And the immortal light, all young and joyful, million-orbed, million-colored, will beam over the universe as on the first morning. <laughs>